Praise God for the showers of blessings. Before we start our song service, I request everyone to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, taking us back here safe. We pray also for the people who are coming over. Please be with them. And we pray also for the speaker tonight. And uh, as we sing praises to your name, please let your angels to sing with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh. your blessings.
на следующее. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praise Him, my Savior, all the day long. This is my story. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy, I'm blessed. Watching and waiting. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. God bless us all. Good evening on this rainy evening. Isn't it lovely weather when it rains? Thank God for the rain. If there's anything that Southern California and San Diego needs is more water coming down from the sky. That's my opinion. Just think, if there was lots of rain, this place would look like, what, Hawaiian Islands? <laughs> oh, can you imagine all the greenery that we'd have? I like to think about things like that. Anyway, we welcome you this evening. Let's see, I'm going to try that in Spanish. Uh, bienvenida. Did I get it right? Bienvenida. Okay, bienvenida. Um, would you please turn your cell phones off? Every once in a while we have one of those go off. <laughs> I have a friend that has one that has a has a, a cock crowing, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's quite something when that goes off because it sounds very realistic. So anyway, we don't want that during the meeting, right? Okay. And um, well, this evening, Pastor Mark has been uh, very. Uh, uh, what shall I say? Brave. He's got three doctors tonight. Uh, okay, doc, and they're all coming via Skype. So I, I need you to pray two things. Okay, pray first of all that, uh, and most of all that God will put His Spirit in this man. Amen. All right, and next. Pray that your thinking caps will be on and you'll uh, capture what he's uh, sharing with you here tonight and we'll all understand it. And uh, let's see. So anyway, Dr. Norengi, he is the medical, a medical director at John Hopkins uh, uh, and um, let's see, memory care and program at, uh, he's in charge of the memory care and uh, program, care program, I should say, at Grand Oaks. His topic will be, be dementia. Dr. Uh, uh, Indupali will be talking to, you know, visiting for a few minutes about fibromyalgia. And Dr. Neller is back and will be talking about osteoporosis. So let's get started. Let's have our doctors come in. 
And number one, first is Dr. Norengi. Okay. It's good to see you. You all survived the uh, rain? Hold it. I forgot. There's one more announcement, so don't, don't go yeah, away. Yeah. This, go this won't take. Oh, come on, Jackie. Come on up here. Yep. Tell the folks. Okay. Do all of you know what's happening this Sunday, October 13th at 5 p.m.? Cooking school. Did everybody get a flyer out there? I'm the one carrying these red tickets. You need a ticket to go to our cooking class. It's called Healthy Holidays. We're going to teach you how to cook healthy for the holidays. And what better time than now to learn how to cook healthy. And you will get a prepared meal, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So please come. You need a ticket to come to the cooking class. And Friday evening is going to be the last time you can get a ticket. Okay. 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 All right. Good Just to see don't you. Go, don't go away, wait. Yes. Do you have tickets? Oh, I don't have tickets. I better well, what, get them. What do we have to do to get tickets? I don't know. How much it cost? They are absolutely free. Donations are accepted because we have about twenty chefs cooking for you. Wow, twenty. So. All you do is tear that off and hand that to me, and I've got a ticket? That's right, and you will be entered into a raffle drawing. Okay. Wow. Well, I don't, I don't care about the raffle. <laughs> I just want the food. So, I, so, so this, all you have to do is tear that off and hand that to me? That's right. But you have to visit me at the table over there. You can't just do it right now? Well, pastor, because you are a pastor. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Special treat. No, I'll come back. Okay, okay, so I hope to see you there. Friday is the last day to get your meal ticket, okay? okay. All right, you. see you Sunday. Thank you very much. Excellent. 20 chefs. That's great. I'm going to invite you, since we're going to be on momentarily, I'd invite you to kneel. Let's go right to the Lord in prayer. We're going to be moving things along efficiently. For the rain. Lord, thank you for the rain. Thank you for sunshine. Thank you for beds to sleep in, clothes to wear, food to eat, water to drink, health, hope, healing, eternity. Thank you for Jesus. Oh, my Father, I pray. Help us not to come short of trusting you. Help us not to come short of trusting in you for full, complete gift of salvation. Lord, we give you our hearts. It's all we can do. And we receive your love, your pardon. Oh, Jesus, I pray. Help us to reach out to you earnestly, fervently, to keep our faith in exercise. Help us to use the faith we have. Lord, if we just go through the motions, we're not going to be saved. We know that the just must live by faith. Please, Lord, help us to walk by faith and not by feelings and certainly not by what we see. We're willing to trust in Jesus, even though we cannot see you, Jesus. We know that there's healing in this house tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to welcome Dr. Malab Nauranji. Did I pronounce that right? That'll work. Good evening. It's, it's good to have you here coming to us from Grand, Grand Oaks. Now, where is that? That's Washington, D.C. area, is it? I'm between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's give them a warm welcome here in Chula Vista. <laughs> we just are so delighted that you would be willing to carve out a little uh, slice of time to spend a few minutes with us. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do now, Doctor. Uh, I, I want to first say that I'm actually a proud graduate of the Loma Linda University Medical School. Amen. Uh, and I understand that this is the Chula Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I'm a uh, fourth-generation Seventh-day Adventist. And um, I think it's just by 
God's grace that uh, uh, you found me on LinkedIn. And so I'm so very happy to join all of you here this evening. Amen. Amen. Well, the feelings are mutual. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a graduate of Loma Linda. And uh, then what? So I went to uh, uh, Loma Linda Medical School. And then from there, I um, left for Windy City, Chicago. And I trained at uh, the Northwestern uh, University and uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital uh, in downtown Chicago in general psychiatry. Uh, from there, I uh, went to the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and completed a uh, fellowship in neurology, uh, behavioral neurology, and neuropsychiatry. And um, I specialize in the diagnosis and management of uh, dementias and mild cognitive impairment. Excellent. Okay. Well, then, since you've chosen that topic of dementia, uh, my question to you would be, how prevalent is this? Is this really a pervasive problem in America? Uh, it is, and I think the key to um, knowing how big of a problem it's going to be is knowing how the aging uh, in this country and the world will play out over the next uh, 20 to 30 to 50 years from now. Uh -huh. uh, there are approximately... Five uh, million people in this uh, country uh, with a diagnosis of dementia of the Alzheimer's type, uh, and uh, approximately 30 million across the world. In about the next uh, 30 to 40 years or so, those numbers will uh, increase to about 15 million. That's a that's threefold increase in the United States, and up to 120 million uh, worldwide. Uh, moreover, those uh, who are age 65 years and above will increase at the most rapid rate. Uh, of any other age group in the world. Uh, and by uh, 2015, uh, there will be more than about uh, 800 million people over the age of 65 uh, in the world. Absolutely amazing. So your call that you feel God has laid on you is very, very timely, very pertinent, very, uh, very relevant. So tell us, doctor, what is dementia and what is Alzheimer's, for that matter? What is this? So this is actually one of the most common questions I get and one of the most um, uh, points of clarification I have to make. Uh, dementia, most simply, is a, is a syndrome. A syndrome meaning a collection of symptoms or signs. Um, those symptoms and signs uh, of dementia are, are the following. First, uh, it is a process that happens in the brain that affects cognition, and cognition is composed of things that you and I most likely take for granted. Those things like memory, uh, b being able to pay attention, uh, being able to tell the difference between what is real and what is not uh, around, about the world around you, uh, the ability to think abstractly, for example, um, organize and learn and uh, execute pur purposeful um, action. Um, in dementia, mm -hmm. one uh, more than one, of uh, these uh, types of cognition or subcategories of cognition are affected, that is impaired. Uh, and the second most common, uh, or the third part of this is that uh, these impairments lead to something we call functional decline. That is the ability to do things for yourself, like uh, make yourself a, uh, a glass of uh, orange juice or brush your teeth in the morning or drive a car or manage your finances. Mm, wow. So number one, it's pervasive. Number two, it is very problematic, isn't it? Um, it's very, uh, very disturbing, uh, the prospects of any of us uh, getting this and, of course, uh, uh, having a loved one uh, that is going through the throes of this. Um, so how do you get it? How do you get dementia? Well, um, you know, I th the, the, the key is that the older you get, the more likely you are to develop dementia. And so that's actually the, the most uh, concerning and the most common risk factor is aging. In fact, the incidence of dementia increases uh, with the aging process to the point where the older and older you get, the more and more likely you are to develop one of the types of dementia. And so one of the things I didn't um, uh, get a chance to uh, earlier talk about is that Alzheimer's disease is only but one type of the dementias. There being uh, at least a couple dozen other different types of dementias. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing is age. Um, other studies have looked also at race and education as being sociodemographic uh, risk factors. 
Then finally, um, lifestyle and vascular metabolic factors uh, have been known to be large, uh, largely contributing uh, risk factors, things like hypertension, uh, high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia, diabetes, um, and of course, diet, obesity, smoking, and even head injury. Those with uh, repeated head injuries have been known to develop a certain type of dementia as well. Okay, so diabetes can be a precursor to dementia and its various forms, uh, Alzheimer's, etc. Is that what you're saying, doctor, is that diabetes can be a precursor to this? That's, that's absolutely correct. In fact, um, you know, we're still trying to understand what the etiology, the pathophysiology of, of Alzheimer's type of dementia actually is. And one of the growing um, uh, hypotheses is that um, type 2 diabetes is very closely tied in with the formation of these what we call plaques and tangles in the brain mm -hmm. that form as a result of the uh, pathophysiological process. And um, uh, it's important that we understand what diabetes and hypertension does in the brain because one, and most importantly, they're modifiable risk factors. Mm, wow. And then what were some of those other things? Smoking can lead to dementia, you mentioned? That's right. That increases the risk of developing um, Alzheimer's type dementia in particular. Um, obesity is uh, yet another risk factor. Obesity. Uh, so let, let me just pause you right there. So obesity... Uh, being overweight, uh, beyond just being overweight, going to the stage that uh, you are uh, considered obese, you're saying that this can be a certain precursor to basically kind of losing your mental function. So literally, our lifestyle choices, is what you're telling us, can significantly translate into losing our mental function if we're not careful. That's absolutely correctly. And, and one way I like to think about this is that there are some things about us that we can control, and there are some things that, about us that we can't. Mm -hmm. The things that we can't control are our, our sociodemographic histories, like our age, our race, and education, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as well as our genetic makeup. Uh, we can't control those. But the things that uh, include things like lifestyle and vascular and metabolic issues are certainly things that are controllable and potentially modifiable, and may steer the direction of um, us either developing dementia or, or aging cognitively well. Mm. So uh, I've got a question. Obesity, diabetes, we know is uh, linked uh, many times to a high-fat diet uh, many times. So is it true that a high-fat diet in general uh, can cause us to... Uh, have impaired mental function? Is there, is there a linkage there between high-fat diet and losing your mental capacity? There are some very high-quality studies uh, that have shown a very strong and robust link between the Western diet, uh, the things that, unfortunately, many of us take part in, um, diets high in saturated fats and uh, fried foods and uh, low in um, green leafy vegetables, for example, um, and it's linked to developing dementia compared to something that we've uh, uh, known for a long time has been um, uh, linked to uh, not developing dementia, which is uh, a Mediterranean diet or even a, a vegetarian diet. I know many of us here are, are Seventh-day Adventists and know very much about, uh, quite a bit about this, but um, uh, diets that are low in saturated fats, high in things like olive oil and nuts and grains uh, have actually uh, shown a robust signal in in those individuals who, de who age without developing dementia. Mm -hmm. So what are uh, some risk factors, or I should say, what are some of the most common uh, symptoms? I don't believe I asked you that one. Uh, what are some of the most common symptoms, real quick? I'll talk about um, Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and the most common ways in which Alzheimer's dementia develops is insidiously, meaning that it starts very slow and subtly, typically by the development of um, what we call episodic uh, memory decline. That is, those types of information that are data types of information, uh, facts, uh, figures, you know, dates, that type of thing, tend to go the first. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, we tend to think of other types of uh, cognition, those meaning the ability to do things, or we call that praxis, um, uh, the ability to speak, or aphasia, um, or other types of uh, cognitive ab abilities that go. Um, later on in the disease, uh, we tend to uh, see a uh, very strong uh, 
um, a spike in the uh, development of behavioral symptoms. And this is uh, part of the reason why I uh, chose this field to go into is because of the immense burden that uh, having a loved one with um, either depression or agitation, um, suspiciousness, um, problems with telling what's real and what's not, um, uh, put on the, the caregivers, the, the family mem- members that are trying to take care of them. Mm. So a whole myriad of uh, symptoms. Uh, wow, wish we had time to more elaborate and ask more questions about symptoms. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so suspiciousness can be part of it, huh? Sure. Uh, you know, we, 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 we think about suspiciousness as sort of a spectrum. Certainly there's suspiciousness that's uh, warranted. Uh, and things that keep us, uh, you know, moving from from day to day, uh, and then of course there's suspicion, suspiciousness that presents itself as uh, paranoia or a type of psychosis that uh, is very common uh, in later stages of dementia. Um, in in some studies, it's been shown shown that certain types of uh, paranoia can be a precursor to worsening in dementia, uh, a sign of worsening that is. So um, somebody who may be thinking that uh, somebody's stealing money from them uh, or it's out to get them may be a, a sign of worsening. Uh, cognitive abilities. Mm, boy, that creates all sorts of uh, tension in the family, and that's played out in American homes over and over. So, okay, so what are some of the risk factors, real quick? Um, the ones that I stated uh, are, you know, like I mentioned, the sociodemographic, um, vascular, lifestyle, and genetic ones, uh, diet, like I mentioned, and uh, age being uh, the most common uh, risk factor. Okay. So uh, what are some treatments? I know you alluded to some of those uh, things that might be good to prevent it. Uh, so what are some of the treatments then? Um, so there are, uh, approxim- there are about four drugs that the FDA has approved for the uh, quote-unquote treatment of Alzheimer's type dementia. Mm-hmm. Um, these drugs are, uh, provide only but a uh, modest uh, benefit in uh, at most uh, stabilizing the decline that we see in Alzheimer's disease. As of today, there's no FDA medication uh, that's been developed uh, for the uh, modification of the disease itself, that is, changing the biochemical signatures of the uh, changes in the brain. Um, There are uh, about half a dozen medications um, or compounds that are in phase three clinical trials that are designed to treat um, the uh, accumulation of these plaques and tangles that I mentioned earlier. Um, but again, these are in uh, phase three clinical trials, and um, uh, more than likely, we'll probably need more than just one drug, uh, mm-hmm. kind of like the cancer um, experience that we've had to treat uh, uh, the underlying biology of the disease. So, number one, there's no known drug cure for dementia and Alzheimer's. That's the bottom line. There are drugs that can assist with, uh, to, but only with a limited degree of uh, impact. Uh, so there's no, no drug that solves the problem. That's right. In fact, uh, you know, the, we, we think of treatment um, uh, as falling into one of four large categories. One, treating the disease, uh, which we don't have a drug for. Treating the symptoms, uh, cognitive or behavioral, which we do have medications for but are of limited benefit. Uh, supporting the patient and then finally supporting the caregiver because uh, a caregiver with the immense burden of caring for a loved one like a, like a parent often su- suffers um, uh, depression, uh, worsening health, uh, and similar types of symptoms themselves. Okay. So our final question, uh, doctor, uh, can you prevent it? That's the big billion-dollar question. Can, you, can we prevent dementia in its various forms? So you may be um, a victim of snake oil salesmen uh, that have uh, touted the benefits of uh, everything from uh, ginkgo to coconut oil uh, to uh, memory clubs to the Wii uh, video games. Um, And while these things are likely not to be um, harmful, uh, at best uh, they'll do nothing and perhaps uh, maybe even improve your cognitive abilities um, somewhat. The Research has shown um, that there are, in general, three things that uh, keep people cognitively well and prevent them from um, uh, uh, prevent them from uh, developing the symptoms of cognitive impairment like uh, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, three, one things. Is, three things. Three things. Okay, go ahead. Number one. One is staying intellectually active. That is taking part in conversations, uh, reading, 
um, socializing with peers, um, like I said, reading the newspaper, uh, watching informative uh, television, um, things of that nature. Stay engaged. In other words, Stay if you engaged. have a loved one that, that uh, you're, you just want to make sure they age gracefully, uh, keep them engaged is what you're saying. Of course, keep ourselves engaged, reading, uh, engaged in conversation, keep them learning, in other words, is what you're saying. Challenge That's right. their mind. That's right. In fact, being part of a church group, there's been a couple of small studies in which uh, being part of a church group like the one that you have uh, there in Chula Vista has been shown to have a beneficial effects, not so much from keeping... Uh, intellectually active, but by keeping socially active, which is a second uh, uh, item uh, to keep maintaining good cognitive health. Excellent. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so number two, what's the number two uh, pre prevention step we can take? Keeping socially active. Okay. Social network. Very That's important. Because right. okay. we know that th those individuals who spend time by themselves, hold up in their apartment, um, c tend to worsen more quickly or develop the symptoms of um, Alzheimer's dementia or other types of dementias uh, more frequently. Excellent. Okay, and finally, number three is what? The last one is keeping physically active because physically we, know that, active. we know that those individuals who do things that are good for their heart um, also do things that are good for the brain. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you've got stay engaged mentally, social network, and physical exercise. And I would imagine, I would surmise that here again, the, the vegetarian diet and taking care of your, your health in terms of good nutrition, good uh, uh, nutrients to the brain, all of this is good uh, uh, prevention as well? That's absolutely right. Excellent. Doctor, thank you so much. Tell, pronounce your last name uh, right. Uh, the, the, the pronunciation that sits the best with the ang uh, Anglo tongue is Narangi. 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 Right. Oh, we can do that because we want to Skype you in our next crusade, Lord willing. And I uh, want to give a hand to the Lord and for him being with us. Yes. And so God bless you, my brother. We will keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Was that informative or what? So uh, it kind of makes me want to uh, do whatever I can. Do you remember those things? Engage, keep the mind engaged. Uh, social network, don't cloister yourself or let your loved ones just be cloistered alone. And thirdly, physical exercise and, of course, uh, maintain a good, uh, healthy diet. Because how many want all of your mind there right up until Jesus comes or you're sleeping in Jesus' arms, one of the two. Okay, next we're going to be having Dr. Indipali who uh, I spent five weeks with in Beaumont, Texas, uh, just recently, as we did a five-week seminar just like this, five-week evangelist crusade just like this, and uh, we in interviewed him. Uh, he was on a rotation with some other doctors, and uh, anyway, so we interviewed him numerous times in Beaumont, and tonight we're going to interview him on the very timely subject of fibromyalgia. How many have ever heard of fibromyalgia? Okay, raise your hand. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you know either yourself or you know a loved one or a close friend that has fibromyalgia or has been diagnosed with that? Very interesting, very interesting. If you don't mind me asking, don't raise your hand if you feel uncomfortable. How many of you have been impacted besides my mom with fibromyalgia? Anybody? Okay, all right. So... Uh, not too many here actually have that situation. My mom has had that for some time. And so uh, we'll wait for Dr. Indipali uh, to come on board here. And then after him, we're going to... Okay, Dr. Indipali, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. How are you? Yes, yes. How, what's the weather there in Beaumont, Texas tonight? It's, it's getting a lot better now. The temperatures are now in 60s in the night. Wonderful. And it's very pleasant weather these days. Oh, yes, yes. But we've got a little rain here in Chula Vista. Let's give a hand to Dr. Indipali for coming out tonight. <laughs> yes, well, it's good to see your smile uh, once again. I told him I, we got it. We spent five weeks together, 
So, uh, yeah, you, you know, you, I, I see you. I always see your wife smiling. So, okay, so what? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, uh, get us acquainted uh, with uh, Dr. Indipali. Well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist physician practicing in Beaumont, Texas. I have a small family practice office here. And what's the name of your, uh, your office, your clinic, your business that you have there, your medical business? It's, uh, it's called Second Advent Medical Center. I love it. Second Advent Medical Center. Does that sound good, yes or no? Yeah, I, I, I told you on the phone today, I thought that was pretty brave. So what is the subject you would like to focus on for a few minutes? Uh, we decided to talk about fibromyalgia because it's often a neglected topic and a lot of people are confused about it at the best. Yes. So um, let me just ask you this. Is this a uh, prevalent problem? I mean, is this widespread out there? Is it growing or...? Well, it's not that widespread, if you know what I mean. I mean, like, the, it, it is a problem that is uh, more common than you would think. Okay. Gotcha. So what is fibromyalgia? What is that? Uh, Mark, fibromyalgia simply means pain in the muscles and tissues. Myos means muscles and fibros means tissues. And algia means pain. The, the phrase, the word simply Latin term for pain in the muscles and tissues. Okay. Uh-huh. So, uh, so fibromyalgia is very uh, real. Uh, is it, uh, it, it? It's a condition. Is it always understood or misunderstood? Well, you know, it's often misunderstood, but you, you're, you're, the people think that it's all in your head, but it's really not so. Scientific research has shown that fibromyalgia is a real syndrome that causes real pain. American College of Rheumatologists actually, rheumatologists actually have a criteria for establishing the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So don't let anyone discourage you from getting a diagnosis and treatment for your symptoms. Excellent. So uh, what, are, what are the symptoms of fibromyalgia? Well, Mark, the symptoms are increased sensitivity to pain deep ache or burning pain that gets worse because of activity, uh, mm -hmm. stress, weather changes, uh, muscle stiffness and spasms, pain that moves around your body, feelings of numbness or tingling in your hands, arms or legs, feeling very tired or fatigued, out of energy, even when you get enough sleep, and also trouble sleeping. Those are some of the symptoms of fibromyalgia. Wow. So does fibromyalgia cause permanent damage? Does it cause oh, no, it? not at all. The fibromyalgia will not cause damage to your muscles or your tissues. It is actually not a dangerous condition. It means it's not a condition that actually life-threatening. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So uh, uh, is there any cure for this, uh, by the way? Uh... Well, uh, there is probably no cure. Mm -hmm. We can say that that there is no cure for this condition. But there are many things to, you can do to make you feel better. Mm -hmm. So how is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed with, uh, like, un unfortunately, it takes years for people to realize that they have fibromyalgia. They go around several doctors, and the doctors misdiagnose them sometimes. And, uh, you know, I'm not blaming anybody, but most of the times you a lot of physicians don't have open mind towards these uh, these problems. For example, the the symptoms are very vague, vague, and you know. But at the same time, they mimic a lot of other conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome and hypothyroidism and arthritis. You don't want to certainly miss those diagnoses. So usually, we check out everything. What I do is when a patient comes to me with uh, multiple symptoms of uh, pain. I check them for rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, um, syndromes like Sjogren's syndrome and any other mixed connective tissue disorders. There are so many disorders that you can have that are treated very differently. If they're all ruled out, if you know all the tests are normal, then you know it, can, it should be fibromyalgia. So how can we take an active role in our health care in regard to fibromyalgia? And, uh, you know, what can we do? 
the the symptoms are mostly managed in con- in in conjunction with your physician so this is called self management the doctor can prescribe the medicines to help ease the pain but there are other things you as a patient have to do to ease your symptoms this is called self management mhm then uh, it focuses on minimizing the impact of fibromyalgia on your life and uh, treating your symptoms what for example what you need to do a few things like maintain first a healthy outlook do not feel sorry for yourself and start taking charge of your life mm-hmm. and and say to yourself that i'm going to live a healthy life i'm not going to let this fibromyalgia get me down amen number 2 you find support in the on the internet there are so many websites that are fibromyalgia support websites your friends or relatives they may have some fibromyalgia symptoms so talking about it really helps Excellent. if the doctor if the doctor prescribes medications take these exactly as prescribed don't just question the doctor who's experts in there are some there are some who are experts in fibromyalgia and they tell you to take for example there's a medication called amitriptyline it's an antidepressant but they may prescribe this to you because it is also a pain modulator so don't tell him that i read it on the internet and it is for depression so i don't want to take it but you don't know why he is prescribing this so it's better to believe in your mm-hmm. physician and okay. exercise 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 uh, recognize stress stress what is causing you to be stressed out and take steps to reduce it mm-hmm. establish healthy sleeping habits for you need to have sleep hygiene set times to sleep don't sit all night watching tv and go to sleep in the early hours of the day and wake up too early and rush to go to work and instead of that just set a nice little 8 6 to 8 hours of sleep mm-hmm. get into a routine just to get a routine don't live your life as a random life make healthy lifestyle choices excellent excellent so the bottom line is vegetarian diet vegetarian diet the sunshine some of the, the not eat the meat products a whole lot and and not not put the you know poisons in your body like uh, caffeine and uh, you know things like alcohol things like that excellent so in other words the bottom line is you're telling us if a person is diagnosed with fibromyalgia they should not look at that as a uh, curse sentence or a death sentence but just continue to be active um maintain the exercise just don't sit around because you're a uh, bones or or your muscles that is muscles ache stay active is what you're telling us and keep a uh, keep a good routine going with healthy choices well said thank you so much dr endopoli we really appreciate you joining us here tonight sure i'm very glad that i could speak to you again on the skype we'll we'll be able to do it again some other time oh yes absolutely and tell your wife we said hello everybody want to <laughs> say thank you dr endopoli thank you so much thank you <laughs> God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you. Good night. The uh the other one I I just can't uh, postpone. The final one is Dr. Neller and we'll keep this uh very brief. We're still going to get you out at a good time. I'm going to jump into my message momentarily. Have you learned a lot already? dementia do you remember the presentation on dementia okay uh, d- dementia and uh fibromyalgia and uh maybe your your muscles ache when it rains or whatever but fibromyalgia and then our third topic is going to be maybe this is appropriate when it rains osteoporosis how many of you uh know anything well How many of you have either been diagnosed or you know someone that's been diagnosed with osteoporosis? Raise your hands. Wow, very interesting, very significant. Well, the doctor uh Neller was here with us the other night and he's making his uh encore appearance here tonight and his subject is going to be osteoporosis. Dr. Neller is coming to us from Spokane, Washington, where he does uh surgeries and and implantation of um of uh pacemakers and so forth and you remember he's the one that was in his scrubs the other day he was actually at the hospital and stuffed the scope around his uh his neck there so um 
Anyway, he's going to be coming to us as well. And um, in the meantime, because we're going to multitask, go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation, because as soon as he, uh, we're finished with this, we're going to jump right into our message. And uh, typically, we're not going to have three in one row, but uh, that's the way it went. Okay, here he is. All right. Dr. Neller, thank you. Dr. James Neller, thank you for joining us again. Be here, um, Pastor Mark. Really appreciate it. Yes, everybody want to give a hand for Dr. Neller uh, joining us here tonight. All right, so what are we going to focus on tonight? Uh, uh, By the way, you're still there at the hospital, are you, or you made it home? I'm still here, still here. One more consult to do. Wow, okay, well we won't keep you too long, but uh, we got a few minutes and you're our yeah, third interview tonight, and we're just happy that you can deal with what subject tonight? I thought a very interesting subject that um, we could spend a few minutes on is osteoporosis or bone health. Okay, so tell Extreme. us, is this prevalent? Um, osteoporosis is, is um, extremely prevalent, especially in our um, senior population. You know, the North American population on average is aging. The fastest growing segment of our population is over age 85. Mm -hmm. So the health of our senior population is becoming increasingly relevant as our demographic shifts towards that. And um, we have two types of osteoporosis that we think about. One is a type 1, and that is a postmenopausal osteoporosis, where women postmenopause become at increased risk for osteoporosis. And And the second type is what we call senile osteoporosis, not to take offense, that's just the name, and that um, becomes more prevalent in both men and women over age 75. Okay. So over age 75, all things being equal, there starts to become a preponderance of, of osteoporosis that we, should be, that we should be aware of. So what is osteoporosis? What is it? So osteoporosis is literally... Um, porous bones to translate literally it's where your bones start to lose their calcified matrix and become porous more honeycomb if you will and as a result of that um increased risk of fracture and um trauma to bones which can be um, devastating often the first manifestation of osteoporosis will be an osteoporosis related fracture so so tell us, yeah, a little bit more about the symptoms and how a person will know uh, whether they have or could have. Uh, of course, they should regularly do checkups the older they get to see their position. But how do you know uh, what are the symptoms uh, that you might have it? So this is, this is what is so subtle about it is that you do not have symptoms of osteoporosis itself. You know, you'll be fine. You won't feel it. Your bones can become porous and brittle without you ever realizing or being aware of it unless you had the thought to think about it. And then the first manifestation could be a fracture where now you've fallen and sustained a fracture, most common sites being your hip or your wrist where you reach out to break a fall or in your spine where um, your spine starts to have micro fractures that then causes your heart your um, height to start to shrink as your age increases and even your posture to become stooped. But the important thing to think about and to realize is that while osteoporosis is taking place, you are not going to feel any different. So it's, it's just something we have to be very aware of that this process is probably taking place in the background and we need to be incorporating lifestyle practices to preserve bone health as we move forward, realizing we may not know that osteoporosis has been developed from a symptom standpoint until we actually start to break bones. So that are, being said, are, go ahead. Yeah, are there, Dr. Neller, are there diagnostic tests then that can be done to ascertain the bone health and the integrity yes, of the bone? Yes, absolutely. Bones? Absolutely. It's a radiologic diagnosis, and it is, it is done um, in a radiology department. It's called a DEXA scan, dual energy x-ray absorptometry. So this is a test that can be recommended as a baseline study in women as they approach menopause in our senior population as they, you know, good time to get a baseline would be age 65, certainly by age 75 if you haven't had one, to ascertain what your bone health is using that radiologic diagnosis. So what the definition of osteoporosis is, is that if your bone density by this test is 
2.5 standard deviations below the average of the young healthy population. So statistically, you are two and a half standard deviations below the average of this young reference group. You meet the definition of having developed osteoporosis. In a range of 1 to 2.5, so not quite extreme, we'll call that osteopenia, meaning penia meaning less bone. So we recognize that you're progressing towards a pre-osteoporosis state. So really, um, as our risk for osteoporosis increases with those two conditions, age or postmenopausal in women, we can start to think about requesting this diagnostic test to establish a baseline study for ourselves. And that then becomes our, um, our, our barometer to compare to in the future as we move forward to try to influence and improve our bone health. Okay, we just have one or two more minutes. What's good prevention? Good prevention. Good prevention is a good diet um, with, with um, strong in calcium and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Also vitamins A, D, E, K, and um, other minerals like magnesium and phosphorus is very important. Diet foods that contain good sources of calcium include green leafy vegetables, particularly broccoli, Mm -hmm. Cheap, good source of vitamin D, also um, Chinese cabbage, such as bok choy. Mm -hmm. And then low-fat dairy products like yogurt or cottage cheese can be very high in calcium. Vitamin D, um, also in foods, important for us to get sunlight exposure or to supplement if we're in regions of the country where we don't get much sunlight, sunlight like in, during the winter months like those of up, us up north. Um, so to include those things in your diet and then to have an exercise routine that includes strength exercises. As, you, as your muscles pull on bones as you try to exert yourself, that strength, that, that tension of muscles on bones will actually cause the bones to hypertrophy or strengthen. It's their stimulus to grow and to incorporate that calcium into their matrix. So we need resistance type exercises, particularly as we advance in age. Let me just pause you right there. So in other words, what you're saying, Dr. Neller, is that we can actually strengthen our bones through exercise, walking, um, jogging. If a person is up to that, uh, they need to consult with their doctor if he would recommend something like that. But certainly bicycling, swimming, walking, working in the garden, doing different things, uh, staying active, maybe a little bit of uh, lifting weights, uh, light weights. Um, exactly. This all helps. Very important, very important. And, and vitamin I like you say, D. Working in the garden, that upper body, you know, that upper body um, aerobic and strength type exercise, just very important. And we should be conscious that while we're doing these things, we actually are giving our bones the stimuli to grow and strengthen. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Any final uh, sentence? Uh, just a sentence or two, and then we got to close. This is very helpful. Any final sentence you want to share? A sentence or two there about osteoporosis. Well, I just encourage our audience to be aware of it. If you haven't been screened or haven't had a scan and you're in those age categories, please reach out to your physician to do so. And um, I think if you're thinking about your bones before they start breaking, you're miles ahead of the majority of our population. So congratulations. And one last thing. I was on your website today. Give us your website. So if anybody, I highly recommend you go to Dr. Neller's uh, website. Hold on. Get out a, p a pen and so forth. I was on his website today. Really nice website. Um, okay, you got a pen? Okay, what is uh, your website? And we'll be giving this out another night. But go ahead, what is it? Sure, it's heartdoctorjim.com. Say it again? Heartdoctorjim.com. So all one word, H-E-A-R-T-D-R-J-I-M.com. Heartdoctorjim.com. Excellent. God bless you, everybody. I want to say thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been great. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Thank you, Ronsa. I love your voice. Is that?
God is good. God is good. The Bible's longest and most amazing prophecy, but let me turn this on first. Most amazing prophecy. The Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy, but first, don't miss upcoming messages. The remnant, the search for God's movement of destiny in the what days? The last days, Saturday morning, one of my favorite messages. Then again, I think I say that about all my messages here. But Saturday morning, revelations, holy fire in the last days, habits of hearts on fire. You will learn Saturday morning habits that you can adopt and maintain until Jesus comes to get on fire and stay on fire for Jesus, soon return. Scarlet harlot of revelation. Oh, yes, the harlot is continually in the news, and she has daughters. The unpardonable sin, the point of no return, could it be that most people walk in the streets today are on their way to commit the unpardonable sin? I want to tell you that we need your prayers because we have an urgent mission at Forever Free, proclaiming the everlasting gospel to the world through mass media and mass meetings. We will continue this 
part of our forever free lifestyle, health evangelism, interviewing medical professionals from around the world and live in person. And uh, by the way, we have a round table coming up this Sunday night, and uh, we anticipate more than we had this last time. We're developing a school of prayer and uh, online, free, 40 Bible lessons. Every Adventist church is going to be made aware. Our goal is for every Adventist church to be made aware of this upcoming school of prayer that we are going to be developing. Cindy Kaiser, part of our uh, team at Forever Free, is uh, in charge of this. And uh, yours truly will be writing with collaboration of our uh, helpers and, uh, and others. Um, uh, we're going to be writing 40 Bible lessons, so please pray for us because it is my vision and dream uh, at Forever Free and Cindy Kaiser's dream that we can help and teach thousands of people how to pray with living faith. And um, it is my dream that we learn how to pray with living faith because it's only what God can do. Amen? And uh, Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel. And I just want to say this about the School of Prayer. To my knowledge, this does not exist in all of North America and online. If you're aware, if you can find any Adventist School of Prayer online, let me know because I don't believe it's in existence. And so would you agree, is there room for a school of prayer online? What do you think? Amen. Uh, also, we're going to be developing and we're starting uh, launching an Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel. And we're really excited about that. And uh, we have a, a key benefactor who has called us recently and uh, said, do it. And, uh, and he said, I'll fund it. So I said, okay. And uh, at least to get it started. So we're excited about that. Now, what can you do to partner with Forever Free? Three I words. Intercede for us. Interact with us. Invest in us. And, uh, and I believe that that should be a matter of prayer. How many agree you should never give without praying? And so I just pray on the long run. Put your local church first. Whatever projects, whatever needs are there in your local church, put it all first. But remember, support things like Free ABN or Hope Channel or ADRA and Forever Free Ministries. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have a project right now. Uh, we need to uh, acquire more equipment. Uh, we need to acquire funds for more video production and so forth. So uh, please be praying about this. Bible's longest most amazing prophecy. Take your Bible and turn with me. I told you to go to Revelation. Did you take me up on that? You say, Mark, I've been at Revelation for an hour. All right. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 22. By the way, we are 10 days from the uh, summit. 10 days from the summit of this uh, crusade on uh, October, Saturday night of October 19. So time is going to go really fast, so stay with us. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. These are the last few cluster of verses in the entire Bible. 18, 19, 20, and 21. May as well read the cluster there. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to the things these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. Can a person's name be blotted out or removed from the book of life? Yes or no? Yes. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful, hearty response? Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. And John says, even so, Lord Jesus, come. How many want to echo those sentiments? Come, Jesus, come. Amen? Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
be with you all. Amen. Now, you may be wondering why this is question number 14, because this is part two of an earlier message we had during that first week entitled Revelation's Most Explosive Message about the hour of God's judgment has come. And for this, we turn to Revelation chapter 14. Let me ask you this. What would you call that process in which the Lord determines who's going to be removed from the book of life and who's going to be retained? To our words, removed or retained. Big difference, amen? So what would you call that process? What does the Bible coin that process in which the Lord determines, decides who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost, who's going to stay in the book, who's going to be deleted from the book. What would you call that process? You're exactly right. Judgment. Revelation 14. So there must be a warning. There must be a warning that your name can be removed from the Lamb's book of life, even though you gave your heart to Jesus and your name is written down in glory. Praise the Lord. But it can be removed if you give up Jesus and stay that way until Jesus comes. I am so glad, I'll just say it right away, I am so glad that God heals backsliding. Hallelujah. That you can be born again. And I pray you just stay in that converted state. But if like me, you have fallen in the past, made mistakes. Thank God you can have a comeback. Can you say amen? amen? Rejoice not over me, my enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. Translate that, I'm getting up. Everybody say, I'm getting up. That's Micah 7, verses 7 and 8. All right. We're looking now at Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, good news, to preach, proclaim, to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's worldwide, it's global. Saying with a loud voice, it's urgent. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, and the sea and the springs of waters. So is there a judgment, a warning message about judgment in the last days? Yes or no? Yes, there is. It's global. It must go around the world. And I'm here to tell you the Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church that is going global with these three angels' messages. Angel number one, we're living, the angel declares, and it's preached around the globe, we are living in the hour of his judgment. The last grains of sand are trickling through the hourglass of time, and the door of probation is about to swing shut on the hinges of time. The door is about to close. Right now, there's a door open, and no man can close it. But soon, there'll be a door closed, and no man can open it. And so, friends, get in while you can. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Can your name be removed? It can be. Would you agree? This is solemn. This is sobering. But there is hope. Can your name stay in the book of life? Hallelujah. So when the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now what part of that don't we understand? It's crystal clear. Exodus 32, 33, it's very emphatic. So your name can be blotted out of the book of life. Friends, this ought to cause us to walk before God with all humility of mind. This ought to cause us to walk very humble. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Micah 6 and verse 8. Can I just say this? You know, as a preacher, 
as a speaker, speaking to thousands over crisscrossing North America. I am absolutely amazed of the power of the Word of God. When I share scripture, whether I quote it, I wish I could quote more, whether I read it, I feel the power of the Word of God going forth. And I can sense the impact of the Word of God. His Word will not come back to him void, Isaiah 55, verse 11. Preach the word, Paul told Timothy. And so, friends, I'm here to tell you, the word of God is alive, living, active, two-edged sword, going even to the depths of our motives, our thoughts, our imaginings, The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the motives. The word of God goes deep to the very core of our being. And the word of God, if received, converts us. It changes us. It destroys the carnal nature and gives you new life. We are born again through the seed of the word of God. We're told in 1 Peter 1.23 that we are born again through the word. And the Holy Spirit uses the word. I'm so glad that there is power in his word to change Mark Fox. Even Mark Fox needs daily change. Can you say amen? Amen. So what parable did Jesus give that relates to this judgment going on now? What we're about to hear from Jesus is that the key issue in the judgment is, are you really in love with Jesus? Because we are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 7 to 9. So even as people prepare for a wedding and a marriage here in this life, pardon me, What is the preparation that we must do in order to be ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb? And whatever that preparation is, that preparation is seen and spotlighted and examined in the judgment. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. What parable, story, did Jesus give that relates to this judgment going on and to reveal what's at the very apex and the crosshairs and the focal point of the judgment? Are you ready for this? If you're ready, say go. But when the king came in to see the guests that were invited by an owner, he he called for a wedding banquet, a wedding celebration, And when the king came in, when the king, this was a king, he called many people, and they showed up at the supper table, at the wedding celebration. When the king came in to see the guests, looking over the guests, you know, so I can see the king in the parable, looking over to see all those people that have responded to this wedding celebration. And he saw something unsightly. He saw something disturbing. He saw something that really, really got him upset. He saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And he stuck out like a sore thumb. And then the king said, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And they said, the king said, get him out of here. And so the servants came and took hold of him and cast him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What would you call that process in which the king examined the guests to determine is everybody fit and going to stay for the wedding celebration. What would you call the process in which he determined 
All of these are going to stay, but this one's going. What would you call that process? Judgment. This parable illustrates the investigative judgment. Say what, Mark? Investigative? Was the king investigating what people were wearing? In the great wedding celebration that we are called to, there's an investigation. The king is looking over his guests because many are called, few are chosen, as it says there in Matthew 22. And so Jesus says, few are chosen. Who are chosen? The ones who are wearing the wedding garment. Wow, what does the wedding garment represent? If you need this to pass the judgment, if you need this to be prepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb, if you need this, if you're going to be ready in the last days and go through these final events, we need to know what does the wedding garment represent. The wedding garment represents the robe of Christ's righteousness his perfect character of love that we have taken into our experience and it's become our righteousness. Although not one person will boast of anything except worthy is the lamb that was slain because they, rec they recognize that their righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6 they recognize that their righteousness is not what will save them. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees, unless your righteousness, it, he, well, he told the disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into heaven. What kind of righteousness did the Pharisees have? A lot of righteousness that was uh, external. You know, paying the tithe and, and doing different things and seemingly keeping the Sabbath and so forth. But inwardly, they were lawbreakers. Inwardly, they were not converted. Inwardly, they didn't pass the test. Take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation 19. I need to speed up here a little bit. Revelation 19, are we learning something? Revelation 19, 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife. His wife. Who's the wife? Who's the wife? These are the people that are getting prepared for the coming of Jesus. It says here, they're called at a marriage supper to lamb. So they've given their heart to the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus. And this is his wife. And it says here, to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Wait a minute. I thought the robe was Christ's righteousness. Here it's talking about the righteous acts of the saints. It's because they, what does it say in the Bible? They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. In the book of Acts, as the disciples preached and taught in the name of Jesus, people took knowledge. They've been with Jesus. They... They talk like with authority, just like Jesus did. They're, they're saying things that Jesus said. So, friends, when we begin to live the life of Christ because of his righteousness, people can see our righteousness, but really we know it's his righteousness. Amen? And so, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these things are the uh, true sayings of God. And so... You must trust in Jesus Christ and his righteousness in order to pass the judgment. There's a song. There's a song that's very appropriate right now. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And it's the same way in the judgment. You must have a faith that can pass the test. A trust, a love for Jesus that can pass the test. It's a faith that works. Works do not save us. But faith alone, if it hath not works, cannot save us either. 
And by the way, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. What is that saying? Salvation is a gift. And we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. If you have Jesus in you, he works. Would you agree? When Jesus comes in, he works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He works, you work. That's Philippians 2.13. So, what did God provide Adam and Eve with after they sinned? Animal skins. And there were the first animal sacrifices. My friends, it took sacrifice to clothe us. We were naked, and God clothed us. And there is symbolism there. Why did they need to be clothed? Because they sinned and felt their shame inside and out. felt their guilt, and the Lord clothed them, but that literal clothing was symbolic of the fact that Jesus clothes us on the inside. So my question is, are you naked tonight, or are you clothed? You can only be clothed by faith. If you're not trusting Jesus, you're spiritually naked, and the whole universe can see your shame. But if you're saying, Jesus, I give you my spiritual nakedness, cover me. So how can you be sure that you are wearing his robe of righteousness? Well, there's several verses there. You need to have a faith that works by love and purifies the soul. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. If you're not a loving person, you are not wearing his robe of righteousness. However, having said that, because we are not yet perfect, we are a work in progress. It's called sanctification. He's making us holy. We're growing in Christ. We know that we may fall short. But would you agree people looking at us should see that there's a general trend towards becoming more loving? there's a general trend becoming more like Christ. Amen? People, if they look close at us enough, will see, you know, well, we're, we're a work in progress. But friends, we should never excuse sin or justify it, but rather we should confess our faults to one another and pray for one another that we might be healed. James chapter 5. Take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation 3. Revelation 3, I love this singular verse. Words are in red. Who is speaking? Jesus. He who overcomes sin, self, and Satan. Would you agree? Do you have to overcome sin? Do you have to overcome Satan? But how about that self? He who overcomes by the blood of the Lamb, by the merits of of a crucified and risen Savior, by the promises of the Word of God. He who overcomes, oh, Jesus, help me. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. That's the robe of Christ's righteousness. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Would you agree? You got to have the wedding garment on. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, And before his angels, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to the church tonight? The Holy Spirit speaks to the church. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit speaks to his people. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us morning, noon, and night. You know what? If we're not careful, though, we're not listening. And so Jesus says here, I won't blot you out of the book of life. I'll clothe you in my righteousness. I'll present you before the Father. I will confess you before my Father. 
Now, what does it mean for him to confess us before the Father? He represents us. He's our substitute. He intercedes for us. He's our great high priest. He's our mediator. He's our go-between. He pleads his blood for us. So who are the first ones to be judged? The world or the church? 1 Peter 4.17, the Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. Wow. Wow. Now, what is the name of the seventh church of Revelation? Laodicea. Go there with me to the Laodicean message. What does this have to do with the judgment? Revelation 3. This is, listen to me, this is the hard-hitting, sobering, straight-shooting, strong medicine message, alarm clock message for God's people in the last days. Those that are to be proclaiming the end time messages, he has a message for them. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right. Now the term Laodicea literally means ones who are judged. So God's last day people in the last days are being judged. Laodicea. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, in a judgment proceeding, in a court proceeding, you need a witness. And Jesus says, he's the judge, he's judging his church, and he's the witness. And he's the tr- a witness is to tell the truth. And that's why Jesus calls himself the true witness. And what does he witness? Everything. The beginning of the creation of God. So as a true witness, he says this, I know. You know, when, a, when there's a court proceeding and somebody says, uh, you know, uh, a person's being accused of being a thief and then witnesses are brought out, say, yes, I, uh, I saw a man fleeing from the house at midnight and they were wearing a green jogging suit with a yellow hat. I don't know why they do that, but Go with me on this. And another witness says, oh, yeah, yeah, um, uh, those, that that, that man, I I saw him at the store that night around that same time. Uh, He came in to uh, get something at 7-Eleven. And another witness says, uh, oh, yeah, what, you're missing, you're missing that uh, flat screen TV Oh, yeah, I went over that guy's house here the other day. I saw that flat screen TV. As a matter of fact, I watched it with him. But I didn't know it was stolen. And on and on and on. A true witness is to tell, I, this is what I saw. I know what I saw. I don't know a lot, but I know what I saw. Jesus says, I know your works. What is he saying? I see it. I see everything. The Bible says, the Lord just impressed me, I believe, with this scripture. The Bible says um, in Revelation chapter 1, it says there in verse 14, his head and hair were like white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Jesus sees right through us. He's not out to condemn. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, verse 7, you all know verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. But the next verse is, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, friends, he looks upon us in love. He's not there to say, caught you. He could easily do that if he wanted to. He's there to love us. But he who is our intercessor is also our judge. And he's also the soon coming king. And he's also the one who died for us on the cross, our savior. 
And he's also the one who created us. He's our creator. Now watch this. Jesus says, I'm the true witness. I see everything. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. So Jesus is very painfully accurate. He says, I know what's going on in your life. I know you're, you're neither cold nor hot. He's talking to us. He's talking to his people, his church, his flock in the last days. He says, I know, I know. I know you better than you know yourself, he's telling us. I know. I'm not guess. I know. I know that you're neither cold nor hot. Now, thank God if you're an exception. Thank God if I'm an exception. That's why more on Saturday morning, you can't miss it, because I'll tell you more about how to be on fire. But listen, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. I could wish that, just cold or hot. So then... Since you're neither cold nor hot. So then, because you are lukewarm in the middle, and neither cold nor hot, he says what he's going to do I will vomit you out of my mouth. Ouch. Everybody say, Ouch. Have you ever seen somebody throw up? Why is Jesus using such strong language? Why does he use this strong language? Is it because he doesn't like us? He loves us. And we'll see that in verse 19, but watch this. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. All right, let me just hit the pause button. This is really going to be an eye-opening, eye-opening series of questions I have for you. Our eternal destinies at stake here. Eternal destinies, are they at stake here? Is your eternal destiny at stake here, yes or no? Is this life and death, yes or no? What would you call that process? in which the Lord determines who is cold, who is hot, who is lukewarm, and who he's going to spit out of his mouth. What would you call that process? Judgment in the house of God, Laodicea. So he says he's going to vomit out of his mouth those who are lukewarm. Now, what would make a person lukewarm? They're godly, worldly, lukewarm. Lukewarm are those who want to follow God. They carry around a Bible. They sing those hymns, but they don't have the fervency. They don't have the 100% surrender. They don't have habits that keep them strong in the Lord. I meet a lot of people, and I have discovered to wherever I go, regardless of different denominations, the people that come to my crusades, I find generally are good people. Now, these are not the people out there, you know, killing people. They're, you know, I'm not saying there's a lot, not a lot of junk around, even in the Christian community. But generally speaking, I, I find a lot of people are, are good, just not on fire. And Jesus says, if I can make this plain, 
It's not enough to have profession. You must have possession. It's not enough to be in a church. You've got to be on fire. You've got to be in love with Jesus. And that doesn't mean you've got to have intensity of emotion. And when you praise the Lord, it must be loud. When you pray, it's got to be five hours, nothing less. (laughs) And because you say, oh, so here is a dichotomy, a contradiction. I say, you're lukewarm. You say, no, I'm not. I'm fine. You say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Whoa. Do you see the contrast there? I am rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. What is Jesus saying there? You don't realize your need. You don't know your need. Oh. People would come out to church because they do feel some type of need, ah, but they don't feel it enough. Can I be honest with you? What I believe with all my heart, you know what keeps us from revival? We're not desperate. You've heard me use that word here before. God saves desperate people. When you come to the end of yourself, you find Jesus. Because you say this, I'm in need of nothing. You, you're naked. You don't know you're naked. You don't know that you are not going to pass the judgment. Would you agree you can't be naked to pass the king's inspection? That's what the parable reveals, right? So I've got to make sure I've got on more than my suit. I've got to make sure I'm wearing his robe of righteousness. Do I look good tonight? What really matters is how do I look before God? Amen? And it kind of makes me not want to draw any unnecessary attention to myself because I realize we must walk humbly before God or we're not going to pass any inspection from the king. Walk humble. Must be humble. When you get dressed, Are you getting dressed to please the king or to please people? And all ladies, when you're there, or men, you're there and you're fixing your hair and getting all nice and looking good. Have you asked Jesus? Have you examined me? Have I examined myself to see if I'm in the faith, to see if I'm trusting you? I counsel you, thank God that Jesus says, I, I, I know how to help you. First, he shows us our desperate condition. He says, you're worse, you're worse than you think you are. You think you're fine, you're not. But I can help you. People who don't feel their need... It's hard for him to help them. So he first must point out their need. And that's where many will rise up and say, I don't need to hear this kind of message. I'm going to go to a church that makes me feel good. I come from Texas where the largest Christian church resides. You won't hear messages like this. You won't hear messages like this. Mm -mm. The largest church is in Houston. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people come out. A lot of good things are being shared, but not the whole truth and not a balanced diet. 
I counsel you, but can I just make this plain? This is no time for lame, tame, preaching, teaching, ministry, working. This is a time for a sense of intense urgency. You know why we don't go witness like we should? Because we're lukewarm. Get on fire for Jesus. Nobody has to tell you, you know, you should share your faith. And, you know, you should. No, no, no. You get on fire. And by the way, you might say, well, I'll, once I get on fire, I'll start sharing Jesus. No, no, no. Start sharing Jesus, and you'll feel your need to have the real deal. You'll feel, let me tell you something. Start working for Jesus. Start working for Jesus. Just do what you can for Jesus. Let me tell you something. It will help you to be on fire. I counsel you to buy from me gold. What's the gold? His faith and his love. He says, I'll give it to you. How many want to have the faith of Jesus? Friends, there's only two groups of people here tonight. Those who are going to have eternal life and those who will die in hellfire out of existence. And it will be as though you never lived. Gone. Gone. got to get on fire. And that fire simply means you go to Jesus and you don't rush it. You don't rush. Don't be rude to Jesus that every time you talk to him, it's always got to be, I don't have time for you. God understands us. He understands our need to spend quality and quantity of time with him. I recommend at least take an hour a day, just you and Jesus, the word of God, studying the word of God, on your knees in prayer, and you will have, I know this from experience, I know this, this is, I'm just just preaching here, something that I know, and you know, when you study the word of God and you pray, and you seek to share your faith with others, in comes the flow of peace and joy and power and of a sound mind. Friends, we must be honest, brutally honest with ourselves. Are we cold, lukewarm, or on fire? Now let me just say this. On fire people feel their desperate need of Jesus. So it doesn't mean like, I'm on fire and I'm perfect. No, I'm on fire because he loves me in my desperation. I'm on fire because he's closed my nakedness. I'm on fire because he knows I have nothing to offer him except a heart that needs to be changed. You want to get fired up? Just one look at Jesus will fire you up. Just one look at how much Jesus loves you. To know the love of Christ, that's what changes us. Why do you think Jesus on the cross is the most powerful? There is no greater power than Jesus on the cross. It's Jesus reaching out saying, I love you. I'll take you in. Now, friends, if the cross doesn't help us to be on fire, really, what will? Don't be gospel hardened. Don't be so gospel hardened that you'll hear the word of God. It just doesn't move you. No, you can say, Lord. Lord, please, please, Lord, don't let me hear words that don't really connect. Help me not to be dull of hearing. Help me to really hear. You know how you really hear? You're thinking, okay, what changes am I going to make? I want to pass the judgment. I don't want my name to be removed from the book of life. What, What changes can I make? Friends, whatever it takes to get on fire, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve as many that you may see and as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. Jesus loves you enough to rebuke you and rebuke me. How many enjoy being rebuked? No, you don't. How many find that messages of rebuke stir up resistance and defensiveness in the flesh? Wait a minute. That's too strong of a message. I didn't deserve that. Can I make it plain? 
God will knock you down so that he can pick you up. He'll break you that he might remake you. He loves you. As many as I love or rebuke and chase and be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repentance means you're sorry for your sins. The reason why we keep going over those same sins is we're really not sorry. Because if you are really sorry, but it's a sorrow that comes from what we've done to Jesus. We crucify him afresh, Hebrews 6. And then verse 20. Read verse 20 with me. Everybody together. Revelation 3, verse 20. I've got to close. Revelation 3, verse 20. Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. No, wait a minute. What is he saying? I'm speaking. But you're not listening. But if you'll humble yourself, you'll hear me knocking. Let's assume, you know, that we're all talking or whatever. And then all of a sudden I say, let's be quiet. And then you heard... Where is that coming from? Oh, there's somebody, a homeless person or whoever is, is at the door. We didn't hear it. How many of you have been vacuuming at your house and somebody was at the door and you didn't know it? Or the TV was too loud. Or even your Christian music was too loud. <laughs> and somebody was at the door. My friends, Jesus is at the door. Are you listening? He's at the door. This is interesting. He's knocking on the door of his people saying, can I come in too? What? These are his people that are professing to worship him. And he's saying, oh, you're all worshiping? Can can I come in too? Do you see that amazing imagery? So friends, what's this? spewing out of his mouth would mean he no longer will take us on his lips to confess us before the Father. Oh, my friends, behold the Lamb that taketh away your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin, sin, my sin. Let him take it away. Take it away. As I close, I feel impressed to share this with you. And this is very, very significant. I have it here in my notes, and I have a lot of notes. But I want you to listen to this, if I can find it here. Here we go. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of you have tried to go to bed knowing you had a guilty conscience? I will tell you this, that I seek to go to bed with everything in harmony between my wife and I. We've been married 26 years. We've learned some things and bumps along the way. And if there's one thing we believe in, if you want to get a good night's sleep, forgive, love. So I would like you to ask the question as I go through this list, and this is what we close with. Jesus is inspecting us tonight. Allow the Holy Spirit to convince you of sin and then confess them to God and ask Jesus to help you to forsake them by his grace. How many want your heart pure as you leave these doors right here, right now? 
Oh, yes, you may have to follow up and spend some time on your knees, but here we go. Lord, I confess a negative attitude. Lord, help me to be positive. Lord, I confess indulging appetite. Lord, help me to eat right and at the right times. Lord, I confess immoral thoughts. Lord, help me to be pure in thought. Selfishness, unselfish. Come on now. Think which ones apply. How many agree? You, the Bible says, Isaiah 58, verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, don't hold back, show my people their sins. True preaching points out sins and calls for repentance. If you want the fire, as many as I love, I rebuke, and chasten, be zealous therefore, and let me in. But how do we let them in? Giving up the sins. Lord, take this away. Remove everything from the door, Lord. And so here we go. Listen. Listen. Pride. Humility. Worldliness. Godliness. Improper dress at times. Lord, help me to be a good witness through my attire. Listening to worldly music conservative in the music that I listen to, watching evil programs on TV and videos guarded in what I watch on TV, robbing you of tithes and offerings, Lord, help me to be a faithful steward of my finances. I confess my lukewarmness. You you know what we just read there? That we are to repent of lukewarmness. Repent... Repentance includes saying, Lord, I'm sorry for my lukewarmness. Is that true? Yes or no? Smoking, drinking, drugs. Lord, help me to be free from destructive addictions. Spending or uh, not reading your word enough. Lord, forgive me for not being a diligent student of your word. Not trusting you fully. Trust you always. Bitterness. Help me to be free from it. Anger, help me to be free from it. Unbelief, help me to be free from it. Unruly tongue, help me to be free from it. Giving up at times, help me to be free from it. Not looking to Jesus always. Not caring for my body. Not reaching out to others as I should. Would you agree? We want to just give it all to Jesus. Amen? Get all the junk. Let's just be, how many agree? Let the Lord be thorough. I can... What does the Bible say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whatever the sin, confess it. A few more. Suspicious of others. Unforgiveness. Impatience. Easily offended. Insensitive to others. Not praying for others. Taking matters into my own hands. Walking into temptation unnecessarily. Hatred. Prejudice. Ingratitude, oh, friends, whatever it is. And by the way, I'll have them make a copy of this. Let me tell you something. Confession. That's what prepares the way for the fire. So let's, right now, as we pray, say, Lord, take all the junk. Take it all. Are you willing to do that right now, everybody? Let's do it. Oh, Lord Jesus. Take all of our sins, all of our weaknesses. We got plenty of them. And forgive us, Lord. We want Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Rather have Jesus more than anything this world affords. I'd rather have Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right, this is tonight's DVD and another cookbook. I need someone to, how about if we have our parking manager? No, he's getting away. Okay. All right, come on, Christopher, let's get this. I'm sorry, Christian, yeah. Okay. He's your convenient Christian because you sit right there. Christian. Okay. Sharon McDaniels. Sharon McDaniels.
All right. Would you like a cookbook or tonight's message? All right. There you go. Would you take that down there? All right. I'm going to have Christian sister do this. Okay, Rick, this is yours, Rick. Hope you, do, you want to, do you want to do some cooking now? <laughs> there you go. All right. All right, Rick, uh, make sure you bring us something to out of that this, this weekend, okay? All right, it's late. Thank you for your patience and your goodness. God bless you. And take the message you've heard tonight with you. Good night.